difficulties. Lord, we pray for them because they're both so healthy. And yet, Lord, there seem to be some heart issues going on. And we pray that you would encourage them. Let them know even today that their family and friends here, we're praying for them. And Lord, I pray for... Good morning. May we be blessed by the reading of his word. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our own sinful nature. By our own very nature, we are subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us our life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united in Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as an example of incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus.
God saved you by his grace and you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. We who are united in Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace, grace when you believe. And, oh, I repeated myself. That's okay. We're going to go forward here. <laughs> so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things that he planned for us long ago. And it's okay if we hear his word twice, right?
We're grateful for our choir. They bless us and inspire us week by week, and we're thankful for the messages that they bring to us. We welcome our visitors. We're delighted that you're here today. We're so glad that God brought you to us to share this time together. We'd like for you to just to take that yellow piece of paper that was in your bulletin, fill out some information. We'd like to send you some material about our church. If you want to, interested in knowing more about our church, we have a seminar next Sunday after church. It'll be back in the back room in 122. It'll last about two hours. We'll feed you lunch. It's a time to find out who we are, what's going on in our church. Our pastor leads it. He tells you something about himself and the vision that the church has. We're always grateful for our visitors, and we encourage you to come back and visit with us each and every opportunity uh, that you have. And for those who are interested in knowing more about the church, remember the seminar next week. Our flowers today are given by Carolyn Ardoin, and memory of her sister, her twin sister, Marilyn Coates, who's passed away. Our, uh, Carolyn, where are you? Stand up for just a moment where people can see you and recognize you. <laughs> our flowers bless our service each and every week. We're so very thankful for them. We do want to remind you of the movie and dinner on July the 4th. Uh, dinner starts at 5 o'clock. You take that little white piece of paper. It says movie night. Fill out what kind of sandwich you want. You have uh, all sorts of choices. They're all good. We meet it out in the best of you, have a time for, uh, for that, and then we come in here for the movie. The movie is What If? All of us have asked that question about our lives or about other lives. This is a movie that's going to talk about that and how Christ moves in so many different ways. So I know that you have plans for July 4th. We finish in time for the fireworks at the, at the back side of it. So therefore, put that on your calendar. It'll be a great time to be in God's house as we share this movie on July the 4th and the fellowship that we have together. Our Teen Challenge people are still out there today selling the vegetables, not selling the vegetables, giving the vegetables. It is a love offering. And so therefore you give what you would like to give as you look at that beautiful products that they have produced in their garden. Remember that garden was helped out by a lot of the men in this church as they helped prepare the soil as they worked with the young men uh, to do the work over the Teen, teen Challenge. So that's out on, out on the vest outside the doors uh, to your left as you go out and you appreciate it. There also is the announcement about the baseball game on July 27th. I know the list is almost filled. There's still some vacancies on that bus. It'll be a time of remembering the Lord, hearing testimonies, hearing some music, fireworks at the end of the, of the River Cat game. It'll be a great experience for each of you. And now the pastor is going to come and lead us in our prayer. Thank you, Mike. As we've come to prayer today, there are several people I wanted to have you pray with me over. Ron Greenold, some of you know that while he was down in Albuquerque participating in uh, senior basketball, uh, he began to run into some heart problems and uh, had some AFib. But the doctors also determined some other stuff was going on. He's home and uh, not feeling real well. And for that matter, Paulette, who had a pacemaker uh, several weeks ago placed in about six weeks ago, hasn't been feeling well. So they're both going back into their cardiologist, and we ask you to pray for them. Uh, new attender here in our church, Art Roy, had gallbladder surgery on Thursday, and I'd like you to be praying for him. Dieter Papps, as we prayed for him, he finally now is at home and I think is doing well and to continue to pray for him. Um, talk to Frank Erb this week about his son, Lucas, as we were all praying for him because there for a while he was so sick and had to kind of terminate last semester down at UCI. Got better here, but it's gone on to his internship this summer uh, with Deloitte. And that's a pretty intense in internship. And he's in other parts of the country. He's still experiencing some tiredness and an enlarged spleen. So I said, we'll be praying for you today. So I ask you to join me as we pray for Frank, and, and particularly his son, Lucas, and Frank's wife, Valerie, too. Lord, as we come this morning, 
we realize that we have the great privilege of coming before the throne of grace, that we can come with confidence because the curtain is torn. And through your body, we come into acceptance with Almighty God. Today, we come to you because there are those in our midst here that are not well, and we, we lift up Ron and Paulette Greeno to you, Lord. Give the doctors wisdom in this week to determine what is causing difficulties. Lord, we pray for them because they're both so healthy, and yet, Lord, there seem to be some heart issues going on, and we pray that you would encourage them, let them know even today that their family and friends here, we're praying for them. And Lord, I pray for Art Roy, and I pray for his wife, Mary. They've been coming here, and Art goes through uh, gallbladder surgery last week, and I just pray for both of them, pray for his recovery, and that, Lord, they would know we lift them up in prayer. Father, for Dieter, we thank you, thankful that he's home, and continue for his continued recovery. And for Dick Schaefer, Lord, Dick's still really having a lot of pain, particularly from this latest fall. And Lord, even as he has to go through a, a number of infusions and things, God, just lift him up. And I, I pray, Lord, that you would just watch over him and bring him back to us soon. Finally, Lord, we pray for Lucas, or Frank, and Valerie's son. Lord, as he is out there uh, in this internship this summer, it's pretty intense. And we pray for this young man, Lord, that you would give him much grace, much strength. And help the, his, his entire body, Father, to, to get back to normal. And I pray for Frank and Valerie as we lift them up. We've been supporting them for a good long while, and Frank does such a marvelous work there in the capital. God, give him peace. Lord, give him freedom to bring your message to those in our capital. God, now today as we come in this place, we're reminded that you are God's, we are God's people. We gather in your presence. We allow our hearts to be still. We long for the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And Lord, may the word of God be your sharp sword today. May it be dividing our hearts, revealing what you want us to see and understand, and Father, doing your own spiritual surgery on our lives. We give to you our gifts now today ask you to receive them from the hearts of your children as we love you and we give them to you in adoration and worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. two ladies who asked for this song. I love it. One pair of hands for the mountains. One pair of hands for the sea. One pair of hands made the sun and the moon, every bird, every flower, every tree, and one pair of hands formed the valley, the ocean, the rivers, and the sands. Those hands are so strong that when life goes wrong, put your faith to one pair of hands, one pair of hands healed the sick, one pair of hands raised the dead, one pair of hands calmed the raging storm, and thousands of people Those hands were nailed to a tree. Those hands are so strong that.
that when life goes wrong, put your faith into one pair of hands. Those hands are so strong that when life Okay. Wow, what a song. Thank you. This morning I want to come back to the book of Romans, the sixth chapter. This is a great chapter. And uh, maybe in some ways, maybe one of the, the deepest and most profound chapters in the book, the apostle has talked about uh, how he died in Christ but we're alive in him. And they use baptism to show the illustration of that. But today we're going to come to the last half of this chapter. And in this chapter, he talks about another aspect of our lives, and that is the fact that we've been freed from the slavery of sin. And he talks about being free in Christ. Let, follow with me as we read this together this morning. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but grace? Oh, by no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you're a slave to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You've been set free from sin, and now you've become slaves of righteousness. I put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, as we open the word today, we ask you to remind us of how you have set us free from that which you have set us free from. And Lord, may we live as we read the word today, live as your servants. In Christ Jesus, we pray, amen. During the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln produced probably one of the most important documents in, in American history. And we know of it as the Emancipation Proclamation. And that proclamation forever granted freedom to those in the bondage of slavery in our country. But the historians will also tell you that Lincoln was slow to publish it. In fact, he stuck it in his desk for quite a while for the right moment for its publication. And not until the North had won a decisive battle, he said, was he going to publish the proclamation. Because in his mind, to do so while the North was losing, it seemed like battle after battle, 
It would make that proclamation seem meaningless and not worth the paper it was even printed on. And so he waited. Finally, on September 17th in 1862, the North halted the advancement of the Confederate troops in Maryland at the Battle of Antietam, one of the bloodiest and most costly battles of the entire Civil War. It was the first significant Union victory of the war. And following that victory, Lincoln finally decided that it had come time to publish that Emancipation Proclamation. And thus, on January 1st, 1863, this great document was published, proclaiming to all that no longer would any people be in bondage of slavery. The Civil War historian James McPherson says that Lincoln told his cabinet that he had made a covenant with God. Lincoln told them that if the, he made a covenant with God such that if the Union drove the Confederacy out of Maryland, he vowed that he would issue that Emancipation Proclamation. And so that's how it came to be. I've oftentimes thought of that, and, and I've thought of what took place the day Jesus was on the cross, and he uttered those final words, it is finished. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. From the day that sin entered into the human existence through Adam, God's plan, indeed his eternal passion, was that man's bondage to sin and death would finally forever be eradicated. Think about it for a minute. From the moment of his birth, when the angel announced to Joseph, you'll name his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins until the moment he stood before his disciples and he said, the Son of Man did not come to serve, but came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for the many. For, from those, that moment to the moment that he spoke to his disciples, the battle for men's souls was on. Final victory blow would be wielded upon Calvary's cross. But the victory proclamation really wasn't announced at that moment. It was announced three days later when the angel announced to the women, why do you seek the dead among the living? He's risen. Come and see the place where he lay. And the content of that proclamation actually had been written and made several days, if not a few weeks before. On that day when he stood with two women, Mary and Martha, standing outside the tomb of their brother Lazarus who had died, and Jesus says to them, I am the resurrection, and I am the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet will he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me will never die. And he says to him, do you believe that? Do you hear it? That's my proclamation. In much the same manner as Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, God had written the proclamation for our emancipation, but waited until the battle was won. He wrote that proclamation, you could say, even in the Garden of Eden, when he said to Satan, you're going to wound him in his heel, but he's going to crush your head. But the proclamation would come later, after the resurrection, the battle was won for the emancipation of humanity from sin. That proclamation I submit to you this morning is really at the foundation of the last verse of this chapter, Romans 6.23. Let me take you there. We know this verse. We probably all have memorized it. If you ever memorized the Roman road to glory, you probably memorized this verse. The wage of the sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's the proclamation that provides the release from a bondage to sin and death that every one of us, every person who has ever been born, finds himself in. Remember the words of David in Psalm 51, verse 5. There he said, I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. And mark this, every single one of us in this room are infected with that disease that is ultimately in a Eternal, spiritual sense, terminal. It was Jeremiah that said it this way, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it's beyond cure. It's beyond human cure. Only God could cure it. In the context of this chapter, 
Paul was speaking about humanity's slavery to sin and death, a taskmaster that was terrible and that constantly wages war against our souls. Until the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I were fighting a losing battle. And that's what Paul meant when he wrote in Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No matter how hard we try to gain freedom from sin, no matter how hard we try to find peace with God, on our own efforts, we fall short. We fail and we end up in frustration and even deeper bondage. And that's the first thing this morning that I want you to understand about this passage which Paul writes. It's this. The gospel is God's emancipation proclamation to all who sin and come short of the glory of God. The new life, the one that freedom proclaimed and offered by the grace of God, now offers the opportunity to be emancipated from an old way of life. And we were helpless to flee from that way of life on our own. Listen to what he says in the 17th and 18th verse. Thank God once you were slaves of sin, but... Now you're free from your slavery to sin and have become slaves to the righteous, to righteous living. What well, he's saying, it's a whole new ball game. In the words of the prophets of the Old Testament, it's a whole new covenant. It's about a whole new relationship with God that's not based upon keeping all the laws, dotting your I's and crossing your T's, never making a mistake. No, it's about God's ways being written in our hearts. Jeremiah said it this way, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law in their minds, bringing their hearts, and I'll write it on their hearts. It's all different. And that proclamation reminds us that the way of life that Christ has given to us now is totally different from what it was before, trying to gain God's approvement, approval. Now keep in mind one thing as you read this. This this book of Romans, Paul had undoubtedly a certain number of Jews in the audience in his mind, some of whom were saved, but many of whom would have just been listening and would have doubted what he had to say. Some had embraced it. That's what he meant when he said, thank God that you wholeheartedly obeyed this teaching given to you. For those who did believe, and this included the Gentile Romans, who had been engaged in all kinds of pagan deities trying to get their gods to give their approval and acceptance. To these people, Paul is declaring, in the name of Jesus Christ, God's emancipation from all these futile efforts to please a master that will never, ever be pleased, sin and Satan. The truth is that the more one tries to find peace through human effort, the more, one, more that that effort leaves a person empty and in reality deeper in sin. And that's a slavery of the worst kind. Because you're never quite sure if God's accepted you or he's, he's approved. It dominates our life every moment, and, and we're always feeling that we haven't done enough. And that's an important place for me to stop for a minute here. It's an important place to ask you to think with me for a few moments. I can't tell you over the years how many people that I've talked to who still, even though they, they've come to Christ, they labor with guilt and feelings that somehow they've done some things that God never, never quite forgives them for. I remember a man one night, this is years ago, we were, we were having a function at our church. We were there quite late, midnight, in fact. And in the front war, door walks this man. He actually was a neighbor, didn't live very far from us. And he came in, and it was obvious that he was uh, pretty low and... Uh, very discouraged and depressed. So I and another gentleman, we went aside with the man and he began to pour his heart out. He began to talk about the things he'd done and that he'd just messed up his whole life, messed up his family, and, and, and nothing seemed to be right. And honestly, he was considering that night taking his life. So we sat down and we shared Christ with him. We shared the, the forgiveness that Jesus offers, the unconditional forgiveness, the grace of God. And we shared with him the freedom that Christ gives to us from guilt and fear. Well, we prayed with the man, 
and he left, and I, I wasn't quite sure, you know, what he would do with that. It was a couple of years later, I, I got a letter one day. It was from this man. He said, I want to tell you, you probably don't remember me. I'm the man who walked into your church that one midnight. We were actually having a meeting with all of our teenagers. It was an all-night affair. You want to feel a little tired and worn out, try one of those on sometimes. <laughs> but he said, you probably don't remember me, but I was that man, and you and another man sat down, and you shared Christ with me, and you prayed with me. And I'll tell you, I went home. Everything changed. Since that time, I've gone on to follow Christ. Since that time, I've gone on to feel forgiveness and freedom. See, that's, that's what the gospel, this proclamation of emancipation does for us. It frees us from trying to work our way into heaven and feeling like we never quite have done enough. As you read these verses, it's clear there's a definite contrast between the slavery to sin, and by that I mean the old sin nature with all the futile efforts to resist it and gain acceptance with God. There's a definite contrast when you read what Paul writes here, between serving that master and serving the master of grace, Jesus Christ. And it's a contrast that's founded on a choice we're all called to make. And that takes us to the next thing I want to show. Christianity is about choosing between two masters. He says, what then? And he assumes somebody's going to raise this issue. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means or no way. <laughs> I hope you'll allow me this morning. I think if Paul, at least it had to be in his mind a little bit, I think what he really would have liked to have said is, hell no. <laughs> now, before you think I'm being trite, and I know my Diane's probably sitting here saying, you're doing this again. You're, you're, be <laughs> you're being cute. No, I am being absolutely theological in this moment. Because I think he would have said that because that's exactly what that line of thinking would take a person to, hell. To look at God's grace as freedom to live like the devil was to miss the whole point of God's emancipation proclamation, the gospel message. It would have been like taking an emancipated slave who takes that freedom and turn, turns right around and signs out to become a slave trader. That's what it's like. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What's that truth? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. And no man is going to come to the Father unless he comes through me. You want to get acceptance with God? You, you want to have peace with God? You want to feel like you're forgiven and free? Then you can only do it through me and what I'm going to do on the cross for you. God's emancipation sets us free to begin a new kind of bondage. And that bondage is what he describes in the next verse in 16. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you're slaves to those whom you obey, whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, there are a couple of words in there that we really want to pay attention to, and one of them is this word offer. It's used five different times in this whole passage in verse 13, 16, and 19. And the word offer here, it means to stand alongside or to align yourself with the desires of another person. It's the idea of yielding. In fact, the King James translates it as yielding every time it uses it. The other word is that word obey. And three different times in this verse, he uses that word. Now, what that word means, literally, is to hear under. And so you put them together, and what it means is to put yourself under the direct orders of a master. Let me read it to you in the Lou Living Translation. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Now, I want to just comment on that for a minute. Paul, I think, is in his mind is, is writing to Christians, but he also is writing to those who are not there yet. And when he uses that word death, you become a slave to sin, which leads to death. And you and I who have accepted Christ, we've been delivered from that. And yet, when we obey sin and we allow it to be a master in our life, it's a deadly way of living. 
You say, does that mean I lose my salvation? No, I don't believe you lose your salvation, but you sure lose a lot of joy in this life. So the person that's never accepted Christ, you keep pursuing that, that's where you're heading to an eternal death. What is Jesus going to say? It's a matter of choice. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you can only serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one, and you'll despise the other. Later, as he spoke of what he meant to be his disciple, he said, he who is not with me is against me. You can't have your feet planted in two different worlds. My daughter, Suzanne, which you, you've heard her, she's sung here for us a couple times. When she was in college, she went to a Christian college back in Indiana. And uh, she was majoring in vocal performance and in theater, two great loves of her life. And, uh, well, I'm a proud father. I think she's pretty good at all of them. But there came the day at the beginning of her junior year when the music department said to her, you can't do both. You have to make a choice. So she chose the theater, and she minored in vocal performance. Their way of thinking is if you're going to be good at one, you've got to pick. You can't, you, can't, you can't straddle this thing. Well, truthfully, I think she would have done fine in both, but they just didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> But life is filled with choices like that. And none more important than choosing to let Jesus Christ be our master. And sometimes following the master even touches on relationships. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 10. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anybody who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Woo! That's pretty heavy. But what he's driving at there, he's not saying reject our families, but he's driving home the point that it can be nothing that demands your love and your allegiance to me more than that commitment. It means we can't straddle two sides of the fence. We have to listen to his word. We have to place ourselves at his disposal. We recognize that this world that you and I live in is under the power of the evil one. And Satan is allowed to rule for the time being. But the gospel proclamation, God's proclamation, that we're free to walk off that old plantation of sin and bondage. We're free to walk into a totally new employment. And you won't lose any benefits. You have nothing but benefits to gain. I think the job description, I like to think of it this way, is the one I find in Romans 14, 17, and I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. The kingdom of God, your new employer, your new company, the new boss, is not about making brownie points with God by making sure you keep all the company rules. Let me get back here. I want to make sure I get this. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a company worth working for. That's a kingdom worth working for. Now, when Lincoln made this proclamation, it was about, he was setting free people who had been born into slavery, a hopeless, perpetual, miserable existence. It would be another year before that uh, proclamation would actually uh, become the 13th Amendment. And even then, even after the war, there were those who for years, the defeated, who made it difficult for those set free by Lincoln's proclamation. In fact, it probably took another hundred years and more. In the same manner, Satan, who's already been defeated at the cross, continues his quest to enslave every one of us. That's a battle that goes on every day of our lives. The Bible calls for you and me to resist evil, to flee evil, to renounce evil, and to avoid, avoid every appearance of evil. But even more importantly, that emancipation that Paul talks about here calls us to turn our freedom not into license, but instead, as he says in Galatians 5, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. As we think of the choice that we're called to make, 
we can't help but be reminded in Joshua's words, and I read these a few weeks ago, as the nation of Israel now occupied the promised land. Let me read to you what he said. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Joshua 24. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living now. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. We've heard that verse. I even have it in my house. Lots of you have it on a plaque in your house. But it's a call to make a choice. And you see, folks, our world is filled with the gods of the Amorites, the gods of wealth and materialism and selfishness and greed and pleasure. But it goes beyond that. There are the subtle idol worships of sports, recreation, ooh, retirement. Ooh, that one hurts. I remember a woman in my last church, my first church, actually. And there, there was a time when we needed some people to help us in the nursery. And so we went to this lady, and we asked if she wouldn't help us. Once a month, that's all we needed. Once a month, one Sunday morning a month. Oh, I don't do that anymore. I, I already put my time in. I'm retired now. <laughs> Not a good thing to say. Our culture has made these things into gods themselves. That's the way of the Amorite. Anything that comes between listening and obeying our new master, anything that keeps us from truly living out the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave, what are they? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And anything that keeps us from reaching down to the poor and the sick and the blind and the unattractive and offering them a hand of Jesus then we're not doing the job. Why? Because it's company policy. It's kingdom policy, if you will. Because the company policy says, this is what Jesus does, this is what our business is. And when we do, the master says to us, thank you. You've honored the name of our company, our kingdom, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of love, the kingdom of grace, the kingdom that I and my Father have founded, a kingdom that will never suffer a hostile takeover either. It's a kingdom and a dominion and a rule that will last as long and longer than any of us can ever imagine. And it's a kingdom we're pleased to have you working for. And we'd like to be able to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, we all must choose to be free. We have to choose to leave the bondage of the old master. What is that bondage? Sin? Well, it's selfishness. It's self-centeredness. It's self-assertiveness. It's self-indulgence. It's all the self-compounds that find their root in the original lie of Satan. You can be your own God. You can do what you want. That's the lie of Eden. Instead, you and I have to choose. We should choose. We must choose the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, just for you and for me. When we make that choice, what we discover is that we've chosen for a very different kind of slavery, and I might add to a very exclusive kind of slavery. Listen to what he says in the 19th verse. Just as you used to offer your body in slavery to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them to righteousness leading to holiness. He goes on and says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at the time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. Paul put it in another way in 1 Corinthians 6.20, For God bought you at a high price, 
so you must honor God with your body. We serve another master now. In the Old Testament, as Moses came to the conclusion of his ministry, and he's about to send the, the children of Israel into the promised land, he makes a final proclamation, and it's a proclamation that you and I would do well to hear and apply to our own lives as we live now in God's promised land of grace. Moses said that day, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, and that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, hold fast to him. And then he says, For the Lord is your life. Dear people, never forget that the Lord is your life. The Lord is our life. It's not part of our life. It's not a Sunday part, but a complete part of our life. And that's what it means to love the Lord with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. It's what it means to be able to sing that song, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart today. He is my soul. He is my life. As you read this sixth chapter, you, you cannot help, if you understand it rightly, to realize that life is a struggle. We'll talk more about it in the seventh chapter. And I love the seventh chapter because Paul is so, so open and unabashed about his own struggles. We'll look at that next week. But the simple fact of the matter is there's a constant civil war going on within us. And Satan has already been defeated, but he's still going to battle. And we've got to choose who we're going to serve. Abraham Lincoln has gone down in history as one of the greatest presidents, perhaps along with George Washington, the greatest. He's often heralded as the savior of the Union, and there's little doubt that he was. This Emancipation Proclamation ranks as one of the greatest political and moral statements of any leader in human history. Lincoln himself said that the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation would define his presidential legacy, and we'd have to certainly agree with that, for it paved the way to the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery forever. It's not always easy, though. He had a cabinet gathered around him, many of whom thought he was nuts. They didn't agree. At least they had their reservations. But later, when Lincoln finally signed this document, he said, I never in my life have felt more certain that I was doing the right thing than I do in signing this paper. If my name ever goes into history, it will be for this act and my whole soul is in it. Folks, a question for each and every one of us, I think, this morning as I read this passage, is what's our whole soul in? Is it in Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? Is it Jesus Christ the way, the truth, and the life, and the one we're depending on taking us into the presence of God? Is it Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who took away our sins by sealing the Emancipation Proclamation in his own blood? Is it Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, who now sits on the throne and before whose throne of grace you and I can come without fear and in total freedom? Is it the Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, who despising the shame endured the cross? Is it Jesus Christ, and I hope it is, is it Jesus Christ, the one whose name is above every name, which means it's above everything that I count important, every name and the sound of whose voice and name one day every knee will bow 
in heaven, on earth, and below the earth, and, and who will one day find every tongue confessing and admitting that he alone is Lord. That's my hope for you this morning. We, we serve a risen Savior. He's the king. He's in charge of my life. He's the one that I know that I've been set free. And I've left that plantation of sin. Oh, I know the enemy keeps trying to lure us back to it. But every day of our lives, we've got to tell ourselves, I don't serve you, Satan, anymore. I don't serve sin anymore. I serve Christ who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for me. I think of the words at the very conclusion of Revelation 22, and I close with these this morning. When all is said and done at the very end of that great book, the very end of the Bible, it says, the spirit of the bride says, come. Spirit and the bride says, come. Are you thirsty? Then come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. And he who testifies to these things says, Oh yes, I am coming. I'm coming soon. And to which we say, Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And that great book concludes with these words. And we'll stop with these today. And let them remind us of who we serve. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with God's people. Let's pray. Father, as I read this whole chapter of Rev. Woman 6, it's an awesome and sobering chapter. Oh, when I say that I've been born again, that I've been saved, oh, there's so much more to that. You took that old life of mine the day I came to faith in Christ and you buried it with Jesus. And then you raised it to life. A life which now is only a foretaste of that which is to come because I'm in Christ. And then you remind me, Lord, that I no longer serve Satan. I no longer serve sin. I no longer serve the ways of this world. Later on, Lord, in this great book, you're going to say to me, be ye transformed. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't let it press you into its mold. Oh, God, remind us of who our master is. Remind us of the kingdom we serve. Remind us of the price that was paid to find me and bring me into your kingdom. Lord, today, if there's someone here that they wonder about all this Christianity business, this religion business, God, somehow today, help them to ask themselves. If you're not serving Jesus and you're serving the other side, what's it getting you? But you want some peace, especially with God. And you want some meaning for your life and purposefulness then listen to the Emancipation Proclamation. All have sinned. They fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that failure, that fall, that sin, is ultimately death. But the gift of God, the gift to every one of us here today, the gift of God is eternal life. It starts right now moment I say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, into my life. That's eternal life forever and ever. But it begins right now. God help them this day somehow by the Spirit of God to suddenly see the scales taken from their eyes and they see it as never before. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to sing with me this morning. Just a, a great song. It's a hell. A thousand tongues to sing. And I can't think of a better thing. We don't have a thousand here today. We have 300. 
but let's let a thousand or 300 tongues all sing of what Jesus Christ has given to us. Master, bless us as we walk out of this building today. Let us walk out into your fields, fields that are ripe unto harvest. And Lord, let us represent your kingdom well. Let us represent it in such a way that when people see us, they see Jesus. And they want his mastery in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.